Hi, my name is Francesca Annan. I'm the lead dietitian at University College Hospital London and the Children and Young People's Diabetes Service. And John has invited me to give this presentation today about my top tips around nutrition and using hybrid closed loop systems. So just by way of background, um, as I've said, I'm the lead dietitian at UCLH, where we're currently approaching 70% of our patients using hybrid closed loop systems. We are using um, the four main systems that are available within paediatrics. We have the largest um, experience with Control IQ just because it was the earliest system available but we have um, a good number of patients now on each system and we are using hybrid closed loop um, from diagnosis. So here are my tips for thinking about nutrition and um, artificial insulin delivery systems and the first tip is good nutrition education and remembering that food and nutrition are actually about more than glycemia and whilst it's really exciting that we have these amazing systems which can be used to improve um, time and range and glycemic outcomes we have to remember that nutrition is about more than that it's about normal growth and development it's about maintaining healthy body weight and lifestyle and it's about reducing macro and microvascular um, complications as well as achieving glycemic targets so i think this makes it a really important time um, that we we remember this um, nutrition education is about more than just carbohydrate counting this quote from the American Heart Association really sums up why the seeds of cardiovascular disease are sown in childhood and nutrition in early life is a critical part of cardiovascular disease reduction. And on what we know currently, we know that cardiovascular disease is still a major risk factor for people living with diabetes. We don't have much evidence yet on what the impact of hybrid closed loop is on diet quality. I'm sure that you've discussed this already. There's this one study from 2019, which is done with some of the participants from one of the Cambridge trials, included some adolescents and some parents and noted that food choices and snacking behaviours did change slightly and were described as a slippage into less healthy behaviours. So we need to maintain our focus on good quality nutrition education. As part of that, my second tip is the importance of assessing and guiding carbohydrate and energy intake. We should know, and people living with diabetes also need to know, what is the right amount of carbohydrate for them. Carbohydrate in social media gets, on, on media generally, gets really bad press. But for children and young people who are growing, 40 to 50% of total energy intake is still the recommendations. We should be doing individual assessments of requirements, not using dietary reference values. These are designed for populations. And it's probably important that we do pay attention to total energy intake and that we also think about how we monitor the impact of hybrid closed loop systems on body mass index. There is a lot of concern about the potential for hybrid closed loop systems to further exacerbate the increase in BMI that we're seeing in the population. But as yet, we don't have the evidence as to what actually happens. One Polish study that was published showing no change in BMI Z score after a year on um, an HCL system. Watch this space, monitor your clinic. Tip three is the importance of starting right. The settings that we begin with are important, as is getting that good nutrition education as a basis. I would recommend that always review the settings that are going to be used in the pump before switching to a hybrid closed loop system, whether that's from manual pump therapy or if we're changing systems. And for moving from multiple daily injections, one of the things that we see is that you potentially need to strengthen the insulin to carbohydrate ratios. So we we recommend calculating pump settings and recalculating from day one, not using what has been used previously if it doesn't match the expected requirements. And that requires some supportive education to explain to the families why we're doing that. 
It's also important that we start to consider the rules that we use, how we calculate our carbohydrate ratios and our sensitivity factors, and whether we need to do slightly different things with different systems to get the optimal outcomes. So having, for example, a different rule for CAM APS because the way it works is its algorithm is different. Thinking about what's the optimal basal percentage to start control IQ off from, what are the optimal settings that are going to influence outcomes in the M780G, so your insulin acting time, glucose target, two hours, 5.5, shown to give you optimal outcomes. And what is the best way to start Omnipod 5? Well, the recommendation is you use 50% the calculated basal requirement input into the system to optimize the, the, the starting period. So thinking about those starting settings, get, getting them right, get people off to, to a good start. Don't start and see and wait and adjust. This is just a really quick example of um, a young person who went from an Omnipod Dash to an Omnipod 5 without a settings review. They had really strong carb ratios, very low um, basal rate and actually what's happened now is that every food bolus is causing hypoglycemia then they were then getting prolonged suspension causing automated limited those settings needed to have been reviewed the start would have been better in terms of thinking about insulin to carbohydrate ratios how many ratios do you need across the day do you need one do you need two do you need three so we would use two ratios normally a stronger ratio for breakfast slightly weaker ratio across the rest of the day. We've already discussed how strong the ratios need to be and what rule um, you might want to consider using. And you also need to take into account, as I said, how does the system respond to the meals? Tip number four is meet the families where they're at and the young people. We know that carbohydrate counting gives you optimal outcomes in terms of time and range, but we also know that carbohydrate counting can be a challenge. So we need to think about what are the ways that we can support families and young people to achieve the optimal outcomes for them and to have a way of entering carbohydrate into a system that will work for them, might not be the gold standard, but sometimes good enough is good enough. So the one study um, from Agoran and his team over at the um, Citra showed that using a, a simplified um, way of entering carbohydrate was effective in getting a good time in range. It wasn't as good as precise carbohydrate counting. Is this new? No, it's not new. As dietitians, we have been helping people to have ways to use an amount of carbohydrate to calculate an insulin dose for as long as I think we have been adjusting insulin to amounts of carbohydrate. As I've said previously, you do need to take into account how the system and the algorithm works. But if you are assessing the meals that are usually eaten, if you've got an idea of your estimated requirements and what a typical carbohydrate intake should look like for that young person, for their age, their size, their, their weight, then you can give them individualized amounts of carbohydrate to be used for different meals that they can then enter into the system. The most important thing that they need to do with that is they need to pre-bolus. So you need to get the bolus in at the right time. And then think about the resources that we use to support carbohydrate counting and think about how those resources are used in terms of accuracy and consistency. Is the information within the resource accurate? If it's inaccurate, does using it consistently remove the impact of the inaccuracy? Um, are these apps actually registered on the NHS app library? Tip five, know your algorithm and know your families. Know the differences between the algorithms. Remember that they can all produce excellent results, but sometimes a system works better with a family situation. So you might want to consider that. That said, experience tells us that all the systems can produce the great outcomes. I would challenge you to be able to work out which system is being used for these three 14 year olds. They are all on different systems. 
but they were all able to get great outcomes because they're using the system. They're entering all, the thing they're all doing is they're entering carbohydrate amounts and they're pre-bolusing for all carbohydrate meals and snacks. Tip number six is keep it simple for food to begin with. So whilst we know that um, high fat, high protein meals might have different impacts on glucose levels and that people may have needed to use combination boluses or other strategies to manage, you need to find out before you fiddle with these systems because for many people, the systems can manage the mixed meals, whether they're high protein meals, high fat meals. So find out before you start using other strategies and then know your algorithm and know what you can do if you need to make changes. So two of the four systems enable you to do something different. So with CAMAPS, we have the slowly absorbed meal functionality and we have the add meal functionality. And these can be used to help to manage that foods are identified as being trickier. With control IQ, we can use a combination type bolus. It's called an extended bolus, but we can use that for over two hours. With the uh, Medtronic system and with Omnipod 5, you can only do your combination type bolus when you come out of the automated system. So what's really important is to remember to educate people not to come out of the automated system to use these bolus types because of the way these algorithms work, because they're based on the insulin delivery that's happened previously. You don't want to keep coming in and coming out, but you might want to think about whether you need to do an adaptive bolus strategy depending on the glucose response that you're seeing. But as I've said, what we're tending to see is that for the majority of people, these systems are working. Beware snacks is tip number seven. We know that snacking without insulin will impact time in range, that depending on the scenario, snacking can actually cause hypoglycemia as well as hyperglycemia. Small snacks can be managed by the systems, larger snacks are going to cause issues. What is a small snack? So if you look at the study that was done on unannounced meals in adults, then that says that snacks have less than 20 grams of carbohydrate can be managed by Medtronic system. However, if you're a three-year-old, is 20 grams of carbohydrate or 15 grams of carbohydrate a small snack? Probably not. So remember, snack size is relative to age and energy requirements, which comes back to my second tip about calculating what people's requirements are. Snacks for exercise can cause hypoglycemia. If they are large snacks, they are generally can be counterproductive. We need to drip carbohydrate in, and we also need to get people to look and see what their system is doing to help them to decide whether or not they need that snack. Same is true for snacks for alcohol management. They can inadvertently cause later hypoglycemia. So having a large snack to mitigate the impact of alcohol has the potential if it's given without any insulin at all to cause later hypoglycemia because the system is going to respond. So we need to be, be aware of snacks and change our thinking about snacks where snacks have previously been used as something to support glycemia and prevent hypoglycemia. They now actually have the potential to do the exact opposite. Tip number eight relates to this, and it's actually about the language we use to describe food and also algorithms. So a snack to a hungry adolescent at the end of a school day might be a tin of beans on three slices of toast. That's not a snack in terms of amounts of carbohydrate. So again, thinking about the language that we use and how that is heard and interpreted by the families as we're educating them is really important. The other bit of language I think is super important to remember is to think about how we discuss what the systems do. And if we talk about the system learning, um, what 
I have learned is that people will interpret this as the system knows what you're eating and what you're doing when. So it knows that you have PE on a Tuesday and it knows that you have peaks of your tea on a Friday, which is not what the systems are doing. The systems are adapting insulin delivery based on insulin requirements and glucose levels. So how we use our language to describe what's happening can have an important impact on understanding and how the systems are used. Tip nine is learn how to identify fake carbohydrates and when to go back to basics with nutrition. And this is about thinking about how we're reviewing what's happening on downloads, how we know when we might need to make a setting change, when we might need to give nutrition advice. If we're thinking about reviewing downloads um, and insulin to carbohydrate ratios, then the two tools I would absolutely recommend, so for our Medtronic, Control IQ and Omnipod 5, use the Panther tools would be my, my top tip. Do a structured review, takes you through everything you need to do. Use the CAM APS resources um, for their system. Get, become familiar with and understand the downloads. Know what you are seeing. Think about whether what you're seeing is the timing of the bolus, whether it's uh, to do with carbohydrate counting, whether it's to do with the response to the meal. And also remember that food responses will also be influenced by what the basal adjustment ha has done. And for some systems, the sensitivity factor will also impact. So the types of things to look out for. If we look on this download here, we can see there's three 70 gram carbohydrate entries consecutively. Did that young person really have 210 grams of carbohydrate? And they entered the carbohydrate and what was the glucose level doing? So that looks a little bit like you need to be curious about what's happened there. We look at the glucose response earlier in the day. This is a school day. Was there a break time snack there that was missed? So thinking about what is it that we're seeing on downloads and how that might give us information about nutrition and intake. On this um, then here that we can see there was a food bolus here followed by needing a correction. Is, is that a timing issue potentially? Or is the issue here that there's lots of time suspended around the time of the food boluses? Is that influencing what's happened? Do we need to just go back and recheck the insulin to carbohydrate ratio calculations? Or is it actually the basal suspension that's impacting the meal responses? If we have missed um, boluses, again, we'll see things like automatic corrections there, no food bolus, and we can see that overall there's only one carb entry. Timing range, that said, 61%. So the system's doing quite well, but we can help it do better. If you know that you've missed your bolus, then how might you manage that? And it's thinking about giving people advice and what to do, maybe if they realise in the first 30 minutes, the second 30 minutes or at an hour. And you might want to think about at what point do you say only cover half the carbohydrate and at what point do you say do a correction, the system will already have responded to your glucose level and given you some insulin. You don't want a double bolus for the carbohydrate when you've remembered that you've forgotten because that will cause hypoglycemia. And for some of the responses, is it actually food choices advice? Would meal composition advice help? Would adding some protein at breakfast help? Would switching out the type of carbohydrate help? Thinking about higher whole grain choices. Would including veggies as part of the meal help? So going back to that first point about the basics of good nutrition education. And my final tip relates to disordered eating behaviours and the red flags that you will see. We have traditionally been used to seeing very erratic glucose responses, raised HbA1c, lots of hyperglycemia on downloads when there are disordered eating behaviours. But what we know is that with hybrid closed loop systems, what we're starting to see is that you'll see a low total daily dose. 
you might see some strange mismatches between the amount of carbohydrate that's entered, the amount of bolus that's given. You'll often see a high uh, time below range. And in this young person, what you can see is a really high time suspended um, each day. So look out for different red flags on downloads to pick up disordered eating. So there we are, my top tips in 20 minutes, just about get the basics right, know your algorithm, know your system, start with optimal settings. Don't forget eating well for health and the basics of good nutrition. Encourage carbohydrate counting and support simpler strategies if they're needed. Pre-bolus. Pre-bolus is the probably biggest thing that's going to influence our um, time in range. And remember, if time in range is above 70% and time below range is less than 4%, we need to say is great job. And then again, maybe go back to thinking about just nutrition and health. Thank you very much for your attention.